It has been another year of surprises and dramatic events. It was only one year ago next month that the oldest of the four Rockefeller brothers, John D. III, died abruptly in an alleged auto accident. And it was only five months ago that the all-out Bolshevik coup d'etat against the Rockefellers began with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller. Today the Bolsheviks themselves are in retreat thanks to the Russian organic robotoids, so the years to come will hold even more surprises for us all. My topics this month are Topic No. 1, the scientific background of the Russian robotoids. Topic No. 2, the Russian strategy to dismantle Bolshevik power. And Topic No. 3, the shifting currents between war and peace. Topic No. 1. In the spring of 1973 my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, was published by George Braziller, New York, New York. In the book I revealed in detail how forces were being set in motion deliberately to destroy the United States dollar. I named a lot of names, and I explained the role being played by various individuals and multinational corporations. Of all the individuals I named in the book, the most important was that of the late David Rockefeller. He was the kingpin in the plan to destroy our dollar and our economy, as I showed in the book. But when he was asked for his public comment about my book, he said, quote, interesting science fiction, unquote. But as events have proven, my book was anything but science fiction. I was a lone voice in 1973 because I was revealing things that were not publicly known. Instead, until I went public with them, these things had been known only to a handful of the most powerful in America and abroad. For that reason, Many people found what I revealed then hard to believe, yet today the things I warned about have already come true or are happening now behind the scenes. When I wrote my book in 1973, Americans had yet to experience an embargo of foreign oil. The dollar was still thought of as almighty, and my warnings that it would soon shrivel sounded preposterous to many Americans, but today who in his right mind would speak of the so-called almighty dollar? As for gold, Americans could not even own it legally in 1973 except under special circumstances. Very few Americans even thought about gold in 1973. So the plans I exposed in my book for gold prices to shoot up past $200 an ounce sounded ridiculous to many, but today who among us is unaware of the daily news reports about astronomical gold prices? In 1973 I spoke of stagnation with inflation, of shortages, of financial distress in municipal governments, and on and on. At that time these things sounded too far out to many of my readers. It sounded like science fiction. But today, just look around you, my friends. Look at the gas lines, the trucker strike, the defaults and near defaults by major cities the prices that change almost daily in your grocery stores. Today everyone talks about these things. They are just facts of life. But when I warned about them six years ago, I was ridiculed for saying they would happen because I was out of step with the crowd. The same thing is happening now in the wake of my revelations last month about the Russian organic robotoids. The conventional wisdom, of course, is that there just cannot be such things, or at least if they are possible they must lie far in the future, not now. But my friends, the conventional wisdom is wrong, dead wrong. They are not only possible but they are real, and they are walking among us right now. To those who are ignorant of the scientific advances that have taken place in the past 20 to 30 years, they sound incredible. But within a small select group of scientists, both in and out of government, here and abroad, the existence of robotoids is known, and certain of those who know and understand about them are faithful listeners to the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER. As I mentioned in my introductory comments, those who seek to control us want to keep us all in a horse and buggy mentality. That way we remain unaware of the forces we are confronting and therefore more vulnerable. Ever since World War II began four decades ago, we Americans have been living with a shroud of secrecy 
in the military and scientific fields. As a result, most Americans today are actually living in the past without knowing it. But in my AUDIO LETTERS I'm trying to bring you up to date with reality. For the past four years I've been letting you in on developments which have taken decades to materialize in secret. Learning about all these things over such a short time span is like having the world itself change almost overnight, so it is little wonder that some of my listeners are getting a case of future shock from my AUDIO LETTERS. By the way, the term Future Shock is taken from the famous book titled Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. The book was published nearly ten years ago in 1970 by Random House. Toffler defines Future Shock as, quote, the shattering stress and disorientation that we induce in individuals by subjecting them to too much change in too short a time, unquote. In his book Toffler called attention to the fact that numerous rapid and drastic new developments are taking place today without people quite knowing how to cope with it all. Among these developments Toffler discussed the revolutionary advances in biology and genetics. Quoting leading scientists in the field, he gave examples of astonishing things which are either possible now or will be soon. All of these are fascinating to read about, and many are frightening as well. In particular, several items point directly toward organic robotoids, although the book does not say so. As I explained last month, an organic robotoid is an artificial robot-like creature. It is a kind of biological machine with a biological computer brain. With this in mind, consider the words of Arntacilius, a biochemist and Nobel Prize winner. As quoted in Future Shock nearly a decade ago, he said, It is quite obvious that computers so far are just bad imitations of our brains. Once we learn more about how the brain acts, I would be surprised if we could not construct a sort of biological computer. Such a computer might have electronic components modeled after biological components in the real brain, and at some distant point in the future it is conceivable that biological elements themselves might be parts of the machine." Unquote. Dr. Tassilius was on the right track with these words of ten years ago, but he was too conservative. At that time the Russians were already on the threshold of their key breakthrough which I referred to last month. That breakthrough had to do with the biological computer brain, which is the key to a successful robotoid. In a few moments I'll tell you more about that. In other places, too, one can find many bits and pieces of information that point straight toward robotoids, but you will not often find this information on television or in the newspapers. Instead it crops up here and there in specialized publications directed at particular audiences. An example of this is the book The Dynamics of Change published in 1967 by Prentice Hall, Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. The book is copyrighted by Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Corporation, having first published all the material in six issues of Kaiser Aluminum News. The revolution in biology and genetics is only a very small part of the subject matter in the book. Even so, listen to just a few brief quotes. Under the heading Genetic Manipulation, quote, the ability to control the formation of new beings may be one of the most basic developments of the future. Recent discoveries about the nucleonic acids, the basic building blocks of life, have led to the belief that man may someday be able to treat genes in such a way that desired characteristics can be realized." Unquote. Under the heading, Direct Education of Brain Cells, quote, Experiments indicate that certain chemicals in the brain will, when implanted in another brain, transfer knowledge." Unquote. Under the heading, Man-Machine Some Biases, quote, Computers exist which can learn, remember, see, seek goals, reason, walk, sing on key, talk, be irritable, play games, grasp, adapt to an environment and even design improvements in themselves. 
Unquote. My friends, remember these things were published for public consumption and a dozen years ago. Further under the same heading, quote, Man-like computers may one day contain plasma circulating through a visceral-like envelope, allowing them to be self-healing." Finally, under the heading Human Robots, quote, an electronic circuit that imitates two neurons. The cells of the human brain has been built and has enabled a robot to deal with some unexpected situations, but the neuron structure was bulky. The brain has billions of neurons meaning an incredible miniaturization job will be necessary before truly human robots are developed." Unquote. Since those words were written, of course, incredible things have been done in miniaturizing electronic computers. For example, a mere dozen years ago there was no such thing as an electronic hand calculator. Within a few years they were on the market, but at a cost of hundreds of dollars. Today, just a few scant years further on, they are all over the place, tiny, inexpensive, and able to do things only bulky computers could do a decade ago. But these things only hint very vaguely at the scientific strides that have made organic robotoids a reality. The man-made biological machine, known as a robotoid, is remarkable from head to foot, but the most astonishing thing about them is their ability to simulate human beings, not just in appearance but in behavior. In other words, the most crucial and most amazing thing about a Russian organic robotoid is its biological computer brain. The developments that were destined to lead to Russia's breakthrough in robotoid brain research began 32 years ago in 1947. In that year a Hungarian-born physicist, Dr. Denis Gabor, conceived of a way to make three-dimensional photographs called holograms. It was a revolutionary scientific discovery, and it was destined to lead to the Nobel Prize for Dr. Gabor. He did not receive the prize until 24 years later in 1971. By then holograms were a reality in numerous laboratories worldwide, and yet most members of the general public still had not heard of holography. And even today, more than three decades after Dr. Gabor's original discovery, holography is still unfamiliar to the public as a whole. In 1947 Dr. Gabor's theory pointed the way toward holography, but at that time holograms could not actually be made. What was needed in order to make them was something called monochromatic light, that is, light of just one wavelength. No one knew how to create that kind of light in 1947. But in 1960 the situation suddenly changed. That was the year the laser was invented. When lasers are discussed in public, attention is usually focused on just one of their amazing characteristics. That's the ability of a laser to produce a narrow, intense beam of light. The beam can travel great distances without spreading out and diffusing. Lasers pointed the way toward energy beam weapons, among other things. And as I revealed long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, this is what secretly spawned America's crash program to get to the moon in 1961. But the reason laser beams behave the way they do is that the light they produce is monochromatic, so they are made to order for generating holograms. Like lasers, holography has led to developments that were totally unexpected. And one of these was the Russian breakthrough in biological computer brains some years ago. When you hear how they work, you'll understand why robotoids act so much like the human beings they replace. I now continue with Topic No. 1. A hologram is a very unusual kind of photograph. To make one, the film is exposed using a laser and a set of mirrors and lenses, and to make the holograph image on the film visible later on, laser light must again be used. When you look at a hologram, it is as if you were looking through a window at the real object. You can move back and forth, up and down, and see it from different angles in three-dimensional detail. By contrast, of course, a conventional photograph is flat 
and looks the same from all angles. Holograms are also different in another way. If you tear a normal photograph into several pieces, you ruin it. Each piece contains only a disconnected fraction of the total, but not so with a hologram. If you cut up a holographic film into several pieces, each piece still contains almost the entire image. There is some loss of detail, but basically it's all there. It's this fact that led years ago to the Russian breakthrough in biological computer brains for their robotoids. For quite some time scientists in the intelligence community worldwide studying the human brain have known one very important fact. That fact is that a portion of a human brain can be removed through accident or surgery, and yet the person still retains most of his original memory. So in this respect the memory in a human brain is like a hologram. Nowadays the relationship between holography and human memory is beginning to be understood in the West. For example, Dr. Carl Prebram, a neuropsychologist at Stanford University, wrote about it recently in the magazine Psychology Today. As he pointed out, the implications of holography are enormous both for brain research and for computers. But this relationship was first recognized not in America, but in a research laboratory at Russia's Siberian Science City, Novosibirsk. The reason the Russians have scooped the West in many recent scientific discoveries is not that they are supermen while we are mental midgets. Instead it has to do with the way they organize their efforts in science and technology. This organization is totally different from that in the West, and it's turning out to be far more efficient. For one thing, when it comes to research, communications in Russia are far superior to those in the West. There are more than 5,000 research centers and laboratories in Russia doing research and development of all kinds, and they are all linked together by vigorous communications not only within each scientific field, but between different fields. There's also a fundamental difference in what is discussed in Russian technical literature as compared with the West. In the West a scientist usually publishes a technical paper only to report a success of some kind. If he carries out a research project that fails, he generally publishes nothing about it, but in Russia Many failures and problems are discussed very openly in the technical literature. As a result, many areas of research meet a very different fate in Russia than in the West. Here in America an elaborate and expensive scientific project may come very close to success, but fall through because of a key missing ingredient. When that happens, very little is published about it. But in Russia the researchers describe their problems and failures, and among the thousands of other scientists nationwide one might have the answer. So the Russian system, which is built around cooperation, often produces success, but the Western system, especially in America, is built around jealousy, and it often leads to failure. It's happened many times, my friends, and it happened several years ago in robotoid brain development. Last month I revealed that the Russians can manufacture organic robotoids which are almost exact carbon copies of real human beings. This is done by a process that simulates the genetic coding of the person to be copied. It sounds a little like cloning, but it's not. A clone of a human would itself be a human but an organic robotoid is not human. It's an artificial life form, like an animal in some ways, but like a computerized machine in others. Every Russian robotoid has what is called a holographic brain. This brain duplicates essentially the entire memory of a person being copied. The key to doing this is a new technique called an ultrasonic cerebral hologram. Using high-frequency sound waves, which are inaudible, 
a complete three-dimensional picture is made of a person's brain. This is a painless, non-destructive process, and under the proper conditions it can be done without the person even being aware of it. Last month I revealed that the Russians are using Nelson Rockefeller's hit list to weed out Bolsheviks here in America, and for roughly three years they have been preparing for this day. They have been secretly making cerebral holograms of the people on the list at every opportunity. This has been done to every person on Rockefeller's list who has visited Russia or Eastern Europe in the past three years. When an organic robotoid is made to simulate, for example, our late President Jimmy Carter, two major factors are involved. One is the genetic coding required to simulate Carter's appearance, voice, fingerprints, and so on. The other is a holographic image of Carter's brain. This image is a complete record of the neuron patterns which existed in Carter's brain at the moment the hologram was made. Therefore, it contains all of the memory and knowledge Carter had up to that moment. When a Carter robotoid is made, the biological computer in its head is caused to form according to the holographic record of Carter's brain. However, certain portions of the robotoid computer are caused to deviate from the holographic record. Uh, the end result is a biological computer which has to be programmed but which contains essentially all of Carter's memory, involuntary mannerisms, and the like. As a result, a Carter robotoid will automatically do certain kinds of things without the need for specific programming. For example, a Carter Robotoid will seem to recognize old friends. That's because the computer memory of the Robotoid reproduces Carter's memory of that friend. The holographic process puts it there automatically without the Russian programmers even having to know it's there. Organic Robotoids are such amazing creatures that they are still a subject of questioning and debate. This is true even among the Russian scientists who made them a reality. For example, robotoids seem to have no true instinct for self-preservation. In this regard, they act like machines, simply doing as they are told to do. By contrast, both humans and animals generally have the instinct for self-preservation. Robotoids can be programmed for self-preservation but they are equally willing, if willing is the word, to perform suicide missions. Exploratory one-way trips into space are only one example of this. If a space mission looks too dangerous to risk the life of an experienced cosmonaut, a robotoid can now be used. The robotoid copy of the cosmonaut is already trained the moment it's made thanks to its holographic memory. Organic Robotoids look and act so much like human beings that it's hard for us to get used to the idea that they are not human. But the Russians decided several months ago that the stakes are too high not to employ them, and so the silent Russian invasion of America by Robotoids is now well underway.